When I was a kid, I remember hearing a song on the radio uh, when I would ride the bus to school. Uh, the song was by the band Mr. Mister. It's called Kiri Elazen. Uh, kind of went something like this Kiri Elazen down the road that I must travel, right? And it'd be Kiri Elazen in the darkness of the night. Uh, now, I know now, as a grown up, that that comes from a Greek phrase, Kiri Elazen, means Lord have mercy. So it's really a nice song, Lord have mercy on the road that you must travel, Lord have mercy on you through the darkness of the night. Here was the problem though, because I didn't understand it as a kid, Uh, I heard something different when that song came on the radio. I did not hear carry a laser, instead what I heard was carry a laser. (laughs) And, uh, And if you think about it, that makes a certain amount of sense, right? So if you're going down a dark road and you need safety, what better to protect you than a good laser, right? That was, that was the way I heard it for years until I saw the lyrics written down on the internet or on a piece of paper as a grown up and I went, oh man, I, I've heard it wrong all of these years. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because as I thought about that a few weeks ago, I thought it would be fun to ask some of my friends on Facebook, what is a song where you misunderstood the lyrics when you were growing up, or maybe even as an adult, a popular song, where you thought the lyrics were one thing and it turned out they were another. So I'm gonna share some of those uh, answers with you this morning. Uh, Several friends mentioned the song by The Clash, Rock the Casbah, as thinking it was Rock the Catbox. Uh, which again, it, you know, it kind of makes sense how you could get that because nobody knows what a Casbah is exactly. Uh, another uh, one that was fairly common, there's a Bad Moon on the Rise by CCR. There's a Bathroom on the Right. It's a very practical song. Uh, bring Me a Higher Love. Somebody said they always heard Bring Me an Iron Lung. Which would explain kind of the desperation in his voice as he's singing. Two tickets to paradise, two chickens are paralyzed. <laughs> I don't, that one doesn't make a lot of sense to me at all, so uh, I don't know why you wouldn't look that up. Hold me closer, Tiny Dancer, Elton John. Hold me closer, Tony Danza. Another person said they always heard, hold me close, I'm trying to dance here, was the way that they heard it. Do you like pina colada? Do you like bean enchiladas? which uh, I like the second version better, actually. I think that's preferable. Now, the reason I share those is, is this. I think all of us have had that experience where we've misunderstood the lyrics to a song, and uh, it's difficult, even once you hear the right lyrics, to get out of your mind your original perception of the song, right? So uh, for me, this one, Carry a Laser, I still have a hard time if I'm in the grocery store or whatever and I hear that song come on, I still hear carry a laser. It's difficult to dislodge my old perception. I share that because the same thing happens to us a lot of times when we are reading the scripture. And I think it happens to us especially with very common verses that we're accustomed to hearing quoted all the time. Some of the most popularly quoted verses also happen to be some of the most misunderstood verses when people use them or interpret them, right? And and what happens is you may have a favorite verse that you've got on a coffee cup or it might be on your wall or it might be on a t-shirt and you quote it all the time, but you might be misquoting it or misinterpreting it. It might be that you have the words right, but you have the meaning wrong. And the danger that we face is that once we lock in on the wrong interpretation, it can be really hard to dislodge that and move toward the right interpretation. And the real danger is that we might be applying the verse incorrectly, that we might be believing that the verse tells us to follow God in one particular way when it doesn't say that at all, right? Because improper interpretation can lead us to improper application. So what I want to do for the next few weeks, I've got four weeks, what I want to do for the next week, few weeks, we're going to look at some of the most commonly quoted and commonly misunderstood passages in the Bible. We'll look at two from the Old Testament and two from the New Testament. So that's why my series is called Misunderstood. You can see that the, the prefix, miss, is in parentheses because my goal is that by the end of the series, these verses won't be misunderstood anymore. They'll be understood. Understood. 
All right, so that's what we're going to do for the next four weeks. Let me talk for a few minutes before we dive into our passage for this week about some of the goals for the series. What am I trying to do, and what are some things that I'm not trying to do? Let me start with the things I am not trying to do, okay? I'm not trying to destroy your childhood memories, all right, one of the verses that I originally was going to include in this series happens to be my mom's life verse. And my mom said, son, if you ruin my life verse, I will never forgive you. All right, so this is what I'm calling the my mom clause of this series. Uh, my goal is not to destroy your understanding of a verse. My goal is not to get you to stop using a verse. Here's the thing. I promise whatever I tear down, we will rebuild. Okay, if you, if you can bear with me, if I tear down your understanding of a passage, we will rebuild in its place what I hope will be a fuller and more complete understanding of the passage uh, where the old interpretation was. All right, so my, my goal is not just to make you feel bad, not to embarrass you, to destroy your memories. Also, I am not trying to help you win Facebook arguments, All right? That may be, you know, just sort of a, a side perk of this, right? But that's not my goal. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, what I hope you don't do is walk out of here with a new understanding of a passage and say, all right, I'm going to go out there and correct everybody else's understanding of it on sort of a mission. Okay, that's not what we're trying to do. So what are we trying to do? Let me give three goals for the series as we dive in. What are we hoping to do? First one is this. I want us to improve our Bible study skills. Okay, that may not sound like the most exciting goal to you. Uh, but my hope is that by the time we're done, when you see a passage quoted and you go, man, I'm not sure if that passage means what they're saying it means, you'll have uh, some tools in your box to go in and say, what does this passage actually mean? How do I interpret it in the context in which it was originally written? So I'm hoping that, that by the time we finish this, we will have sharpened that toolbox just a little bit so that with any passage, not just these four, we'll have some, some greater skills. Because the truth is, I've only got four weeks. This series could go on for 10, 15, 20 weeks with misunderstood and misinterpreted passages. I've only got four. So the goal is not just to talk about these four, but to broaden it out and say, how do we deal with any passage when somebody quotes a verse and says, this is what it means, all right? So to improve our Bible study skills, secondly, to clarify misunderstood verses. What I have done, I've tried to pick four of the most commonly quoted verses in our culture. The ones that I've picked are ones that you no doubt will have heard quoted, or at least someone may have quoted the concept to you, even if they didn't realize they were quoting the Bible. So I want to take some of these ones that are very, very commonly quoted, look at how they're misunderstood, and then give us, what is the scripture actually saying here? That's what we'll do. And then thirdly, to help us obey God's word more faithfully. That's the, that's the ultimate end, hopefully, of this series. Again, like I said earlier, improper interpretation. If I understand the meaning of a passage wrong, then I am very likely to apply it wrong, All right? If I believe it's telling me to do one thing or saying one thing about God, and when it's really saying something different, then my approach to following God, even my beliefs about God, might be wrong. And that can damage my understanding of who he is, my understanding of how he feels and thinks toward me, my understanding of what I ought to do in response to a verse. So let me give you just one example. We're not going to uh, cover this particular passage in our series, but you'll remember last fall, we preached from the book of Philippians. We did a series on Philippians, and, and there's a verse in Philippians 4, 13, that you hear quoted all the time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? It's, it's th thrown out all the time. Maybe one of the most common ways you see the passage used is like this, right? At a sporting event. So you've got football players and they're running into the stadium and they've got it on a banner. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And the implication is I can either win this game or play really well or do better than the other team because Jesus strengthens me for the task. Jesus is on the side of whatever team this happens to be, right? Now the challenge with that is, you know, what if you lose? What does that say about Jesus, or what if you win? What does that say about the other team's relationship with Jesus? And if you begin to understand the passage in this way over time, and then you're disappointed when you can't do anything that you want all the time, 
how does that begin to affect your perception of God? Is God a liar? Are God's promises untrue? Well, no, you'll remember when we place a passage like this in its context, what is Paul saying? Well, he's actually saying, whether I've got a lot, whether I've got a little, whether I am a winner in life or a loser in the eyes of the world around me, I can be content. I can trust in Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is, I can follow Jesus faithfully and trust him, whether I win, whether I lose, whether I have a lot, whether I have a little, right? And so placing the passage in its context all of a sudden adds an element of understanding to our walk with the Lord. So that's what we're hoping to do with this series is take some of these passages that are frequently misunderstood and add some insight and light to them so that we understand not only the passage, but more about who God is. Okay, so let me just give briefly, this is how, uh, these are our goals. Again, improve our Bible study skills, clarify misunderstood verses, and to obey God's word more faithfully. Each week, here's essentially what the outline is going to be. First of all, we'll look at how is the passage typically interpreted. I'll probably share a couple of quotes from people, either Christian or non-Christian, who have used this verse and how they use the verse. Secondly, we'll look at what does it really mean. I'll kind of tackle why is the typical understanding of the passage wrong, and then what does it really mean. And then thirdly, how do we apply it, right? How are we going to take this passage and, and apply it to our walk with Jesus, to our spiritual life? So that's, that's how we'll lay out each week. All right, so that kind of gives you a sense of the overview of the series. Now that we've done that, let me dive into our passage for this week. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. If you've got a Bible, you may want to get over to Matthew 7. I'm going to have it up here on the screen, a passage that you have heard quoted, at least portions of it quoted a lot. Let me read it. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, And behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, this passage is so frequently quoted that I would guess if you were to walk up to somebody on the street, even if they don't go to church, and you ask this question, what is something that Jesus said? Okay, the odds are probably better than 50% that they will say, do not judge, right? Everybody knows it. Jesus said, do not judge, right? And so, so this is extremely frequently quoted. In fact, people quote it without even realizing where it comes from. Probably they only remember the first three words of verse one, right? Do not judge. That's it. Jesus said, do not judge. They might remember the rest of that sentence. Do not judge lest ye be judged, right? And so they might say it in that way. Very, very commonly quoted. And the question is, how is it normally Understood. Now I'm going to give a couple of quotes here in a minute, but let me summarize the standard interpretation of the passage. Here it is. Never make moral judgments about what other people do, say, or believe, right? Never make moral judgments about what other people do, say, or believe. That is, whatever I'm doing, you don't have the right to tell me that it's wrong. And whatever you're doing or believing or saying, I don't have the right to tell you it's wrong, that I should never make any sort of moral distinction between right or wrong or good or evil, right? Don't make moral judgments. Let me give you a couple of quotes from some celebrities for how they have used this passage. Sarah Jessica Parker, the actress, she says, I don't judge others. I say, if you feel good with what you're doing, let your freak flag fly. I had to practice saying that a few times so that I wouldn't mess it up. But you see your idea, like I don't, I don't judge, right? You feel good with it, go ahead, do it. Who am I to say it's wrong? Who am I to say it's right? Who are you to say what is right or wrong? If you feel good with it, do it. Let me give you another. This is from uh, Dolly Parton, the singer. She says, we're not supposed to pass judgment. Our Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. We're all God's children. 
No matter how we try to get to heaven, we all want to go there. We just have our own routes to take, and that's how I look at it, right? So what's she saying? Your way to heaven is no better than my way to heaven, and vice versa. I'm not going to judge your path. You don't judge my path. I'm not going to make any sort of moral judgment. Now, I've seen this passage used all over the place in all sorts of contexts, right? So sometimes in small contexts, imagine you're at a, a party and you're going through the dessert line or at a wedding and the, the person in front of you grabs three cookies and they look behind them and they see you and they say what? Don't judge me. I like cookies, right? And what are you thinking? I wasn't necessarily judging you. It's just that I want you to save some, right, for me. Right, but we use it all the time in that type of context. We may use it uh, quite frequently in our, in our culture. It is used in, in the context of sexual ethics, right? So, so if somebody says that uh, sex is, is meant for marriage between a man and a woman, somebody says, well, who are you to judge, right? Don't judge me based on what you believe, and I've seen it in the political arena, not to bring up bad memories, but I saw this during the 2016 presidential election and the lead up to it. Somebody would say, well, your candidate is immoral. And the other person would say, well, your candidate is immoral. And on both sides, people would say, well, who are you to judge my candidate? But I'll judge your candidate, right? But who are you to judge mine? And the idea typically behind the use of this verse is, hey, whatever I'm doing, you just need to step back. You don't have the right to tell me that what I'm doing crosses some kind of a boundary. That's typically how it's used, as a way to silence our critics and say, do not ever make a moral judgment about what another person says or does or believes. So what we want to look at then for a few minutes is why does that understanding of the passage miss the mark? Why is it incorrect? And then we'll, we'll kind of rebuild what is Jesus actually saying in Matthew chapter 7. All right, so let's look at a few reasons the typical interpretation is wrong. First one is this. The Bible actually encourages us to make moral judgments, right? So there are, there are tons of passages in the scripture where we are encouraged to make moral judgments. Let me just share a few of them with you this morning. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside God judges? Remove the wicked man from among you. Now, if you remember the context of 1 Corinthians 5, this is a a passage about sexual ethics. There was a man in the church in Corinth who was was sleeping with his mother-in-law. And Paul says, now, in that context, man, you are are meant to judge. You are supposed to judge this guy because he is sinning against God. He is damaging the church. He is threatening the unity of the church. So what you need to do is you need to make a judgment and then get him out, right? So this is in a church discipline type of context. But Paul says, look, that's part of what you're meant to do is make that sort of moral judgment, at least within the church. You're called to do that. Let me give you a couple of other passages. If your brother sins, go and show him the fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Now, these are the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, and he is talking broadly about discipline within the church. But notice the first step is if, if I sin against you, you are to come to me and you're to say, hey, Matt, what you did was what? Was, was wrong. It was sinful. It violated God's standards. Now, in order to do that, you have to make a moral judgment. You have to come to me and you have to say, Matt, that was wrong. There's a boundary and you've crossed it. All right, that's what Jesus is saying. Let me give you a couple others. James 5, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death. Now, I want to pause here for just a minute because it's important what James is getting at. He says, if somebody is sinning and they're wandering down the path of sin and destruction, he says, what you are called to do is not only make a moral judgment about their behavior, but then go to them and say, hey, you need to turn around because you're headed in the wrong direction. And he says, you could save that person's life or soul. Right? Notice the idea is, I make a moral judgment. Why? Not to hurt you, 
but to save you, to pull you back from the brink of destruction. So James says, you're called to make those moral judgments, to go and say, now you're in sin and you're headed toward destruction. Let me give you one more because this will come into play later. Jesus, John chapter seven says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment, right? So in other words, you are supposed to judge. You're just supposed to judge the right way. Okay, now that's gonna be critical as we look at Matthew chapter seven in detail in a few minutes. All right, so uh, the the typical interpretation misses the mark first because the Bible encourages us to make moral judgments, right? And and I wanna, again, focus on this idea that typically when we are encouraged to make moral judgments, the purpose is restoration rather than simply condemnation, all right? So the idea is not that I make moral judgments to make you feel bad, I don't make moral judgments because I think I'm better than you. I make moral judgments because I know that the path of sin is the path of death. And so when a person comes and says, you're in sin and that is wrong and you need to turn, the idea is, I don't want you to go down the pathway of destruction. Okay, so let me give you an illustration. A few years ago, I read an article about a woman named Catherine Warburton. Catherine Warburton was at the uh, Alaska Zoo one day in 1994, and she was standing outside the enclosure of Binky the polar bear, which uh, Binky is not the best name for a polar bear, but okay, because it doesn't sound as tough as a polar bear is, right? And that may have been part of what deceived her, because Catherine Warburton decided that she needed to get a close-up photo of Binky. So she climbed over one fence and she climbed over a second fence and she went right up to the bars where Binky was and she proceeded to grab her camera and try to reach through the bars to take a really good photo of Binky. Unfortunately, Binky was in no mood for the paparazzi that day and uh, he grabbed her leg and bit her on the thigh and broke her leg. Now she got away, but she was lucky to be alive. In fact, uh, an interview with her a couple years ago, she said that was the stupidest thing I ever did in my life. Now, I share that because I want you to imagine this scenario. Imagine you and I are at the zoo and we are outside the polar bear enclosure and I say, man, that bear looks lonely. He needs a hug. I'm gonna climb on over and I'm gonna give him a hug, right? And you're standing next to me and you go, man, uh, you know, the sign, the sign says not to do that. And I go, now, who are you to judge me, right? I like bears. That bear is lonely. You don't care about that bear. And you say, no, man, the the sign says don't do it. And I think there's a reason for it because you might get hurt. And I go, look, you have a dog. I've seen you with your dog. You pet him and dogs can be dangerous. Who are you to judge me? And I climb in the enclosure. Now, what are you trying to do? You're not trying to hurt my feelings, You're trying to save my life, right? So you point out the boundary. There's a fence for a reason. There's a sign for a reason. There's another fence for a reason and a sign for a reason. Polar bear has sharp claws and teeth for a reason. That's nature's way of saying, don't hug me, right? (laughs) You're trying to help, right? That's what the scripture says when it encourages us to make moral judgments. The way of life is found in following God. The way of death is is found in running away from God. So we're called to make moral judgments, right? So Matthew 7 cannot be saying we should never make any moral judgments of any kind. Secondly, the normal approach to this passage takes it out of its context, okay? The passage says a whole lot more than do not judge, all right? Those are just the first three words. We're gonna talk in a couple of minutes about what all the passage does say, but this is a critical moment for us to stop And and I want to point this out. Anytime somebody takes one verse that is a part of a, a longer sentence and uses it to make a point, we should be suspicious. Okay, because the verse is placed in a much broader context. There's a lot more to it than do not judge. Yet often what we do is, is we interrupt Jesus right in the middle of what he's saying. He says, do not judge less. And before he even finishes the rest of it, we go, oh yeah, I got it. I know what you mean. Don't judge. Don't ever do any judging. Right, and Jesus is going, what? I had more to say. 
I don't know if uh, those of you who are parents have ever experienced this with your children. I have periodically where you might look at them and you might say, uh, son or daughter, I need you to, and you begin to talk and they go, yeah, I know what you're gonna say, dad. You're gonna say I need to do the dishes, right? And, and, and they may be right, right? Sometimes they're right and you go, yes, that is what I was gonna say. You need to do the dishes, But it could be that I was gonna say, hey, son, I need you to go put on your shoes because we're going out for ice cream. But you assumed you knew what I was gonna say. So now you gotta do the dishes, right? Because you know. (laughs) Right, you don't want somebody to take a portion of what you say and use it for a life principle. But that's what we do with a lot of these verses. Uh, I had a a seminary professor who used to say the three most important aspects of interpreting the Bible are context, context, and context. What are the verses that surround it? What are the verses that come before and after? What is the book that it's placed in? How does it fit in the context of the whole scripture? Okay, so we're going to look at what more the passage says here in just a few minutes. But the passage says a whole lot more than do not judge. All right, thirdly, everybody makes moral judgments. Everybody makes moral judgments. I don't care who you are, you have some idea that some things are right and some things are wrong. Nobody goes through life without making moral judgments, right? So to to say you should never judge is actually a self-defeating statement. It is a moral judgment to say judgment is wrong. Everybody makes moral judgments. So for just a minute, let's go back to the quotes I shared a few minutes ago. Sarah Jessica Parker, the actress, probably best known for the 1990s TV series Sex and the City, right? And the overarching concept of the series was that especially when it comes to sexual ethics, anything goes, right? And yet I read an interview with her uh, maybe last year in the wake of the Me Too movement, in which she said, you know, upon reflection, maybe it's not true that anything goes. Maybe we should set some boundaries around things like coercion. Maybe we should set some boundaries around things like pressure. Right now, you may say, hey, uh, you know what? Those are insufficient boundaries for a sexual ethic. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Right, but don't lose the point that by doing that, she is making moral judgments to say what I once thought might be okay I no longer can affirm what I once thought was right is now wrong but in doing that there's a moral judgment or let's let's go to Dolly Parton for a second Dolly Parton says look you can never make a judgment so you might say well then Dolly uh, on the basis of what moral authority can you say to Jolene don't take my man just because you can Right, And Jolene might say, look, my beauty is beyond compare with flaming locks of auburn hair and ivory skin and eyes of emerald green. And I want your man. And I'm going to take him. Now, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, (laughs) it's all right. Here's the only thing I'd say. Just know Jolene is a terrible person. She's a homewrecker and a thief. Okay, so let's imagine for a minute that you say, look, you shouldn't do that, right? You should not come into somebody else's house and take her man. You should not walk into someone else's kitchen and take their food, right? It's one thing to say, I have no moral judgment to make, but when you walk into my house, all of a sudden I draw a line, don't I? Everybody makes moral judgments. It's impossible to move through life without it. So the question is, how do we make the right judgments as opposed to the wrong judgments? And that's what Jesus is addressing in Matthew chapter 7. What is it that Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 7? What does it actually mean? Here's how I'm going to summarize Jesus' meaning, and then, then I'll give more detail about how he lays this out. When you make judgments, right? Not if. When you make judgments... Do so carefully and charitably. When you make judgments, do so carefully and charitably. All right, I, wa- I want to place this passage for just a couple of minutes in its context, where it is set in the book of Matthew and in, in the gospel of Matthew. Matthew. 
Uh, If you know where Matthew 7 is in the flow of the book of Matthew, this is in a sermon Jesus gave called the Sermon on the Mount, right? It is uh, one of the longer speeches that Jesus gives in all of the Gospels. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he begins by talking to his disciples, but then as he's speaking, apparently other people gather around because by the time you get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, there's a big crowd around. All right, so Jesus begins to teach, and you, you'll remember the Sermon on the Mount begins with what we call the Beatitudes, right? Beatitudes are just, it's just a way of saying the, the blessed verses, right? Beatitude comes from a Latin word that, that means blessed, right? And so Jesus begins these, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are the meek, right? For they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And here's what he sets up. If you want to have a life that is in harmony with God and in harmony with other people, here's how you ought to approach your life, right? So that's what the Beatitudes basically are. You ought to approach your life with humility. You ought to approach your life poor in spirit. That is saying, I need what God has to offer me because I don't have what I need for my life. I need righteousness. I need humility. I want to seek to trust God with my life, right? So he lists out these Beatitudes. And then for the remainder of the Sermon on the Mount, most of what Jesus is doing is expounding on those Beatitudes. All right, so Jesus talks about some things that will keep you from this life of blessedness or happiness before God, right? So he talks about interpersonal conflict and how we fail to resolve it well. He talks about anxiety and how anxiety keeps us from trusting in God. He talks about pride and particularly religious pride. When I, when I am trying to show off how religious I am, I not only place a barrier between me and you, but a barrier between me and God. He talks about greed and how the love of money can separate us from harmony with God and others, right? And, and then here in Matthew chapter 7, what he talks about is a lack of mercy, right? Because remember, one of the Beatitudes is blessed are the merciful. Right, blessed are also the, the gentle, the meek, right? And so here he says, here is what it looks like to lack mercy, and here is the consequence if you lack mercy, right? Because if I fail to be merciful toward others, then I am not reflecting the character of God. If I fail to treat others with the grace that God treats others with, then I am not reflecting the character of God. And that places a barrier between me and God, and it places a barrier between me and you, right? So what Jesus says is when you make judgments, remember, you're going to make judgments, but when you make judgments, make sure, first of all, that you use the right standard, and second of all, that you look at yourself first. In other words, make sure you're not using standards that you made up in order to judge others so that I can say, look, I've I've created a standard and you have to follow it uh, and I created it because it happens to be something I'm really good at and you've got to follow it. But also make sure that you are adhering to whatever standard you're using to judge somebody else. Why? Because if not, he's going to say, look, by whatever standard you judge, you will be judged. Romans chapter 2, Paul says something very similar to us. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things, right? Don't judge somebody by a standard that you don't meet. Don't judge somebody by a standard that you made up. All right, so as we look at Matthew chapter 7 then, I want to give a couple of principles that Jesus lays out for how we ought to judge. How should we judge if we're going to judge? First principle is this. One, make sure that your standard is correct, right? Make sure that your standard is correct. Now, if you'll remember, uh, there's a passage in the Old Testament that is very similar in its tone to Matthew chapter 7. And, and what, what you may remember is at 1 Samuel 16, remember the prophet Samuel, 
He comes to Bethlehem because God says, hey, in Bethlehem, you're going to find the next king of Israel. You remember that? So Samuel comes, and he's supposed to anoint the king, and God says, Samuel, the king is going to be one of Jesse's sons. All right, so Samuel shows up, and he sees the oldest one. His name was Eliab. And Eliab, the qualification that Samuel is operating by is basically, oh, man, this has to be the guy. Why? He looks like a king. Eliab is tall. Eliab is handsome. Now, what is underlying this this passage is that, you remember the first king of Israel? His name was Saul. How did they choose Saul, essentially? He was very tall, right? That's the only thing that is listed, really, as a qualification for Saul. He's a head taller than everybody else. And so they go, he's the guy. right? So here's Samuel about to make the same mistake, right? Because Saul was basically a train wreck of a king. He wandered away from God. He disobeyed God. He led the people into disobedience. Now here is Samuel about to make the same mistake again. And what does God say? He says, now don't look at his height or his appearance. Why? Because man looks at the outward appearance. But God does what? God looks at the heart. What's the idea? Samuel, God has a standard of righteousness that that you're not following. God has a standard and we have a standard. Samuel, make sure the standard you're using is the right standard. When Jesus brings this up in Matthew chapter 7, there's no doubt a reference to the way that the Pharisees judged other people. right, Pharisee, by the way, comes from a word that means holy or set apart or pure. Right, The Pharisees were the pure ones. If you were in the first century, you would have probably admired the Pharisees. They they get a bad rep now, but the Pharisees, they were the righteous guys, right? They were the ones who followed the rules better than you. Okay, and so Jesus says, look, I don't want you to set some standard up and use that as a standard of righteousness so that you can stand up on a hill and say, I am good and you are bad. I am in and you are out. So elsewhere, here's what Jesus would say to the Pharisees about their standards. I want want us to read this here. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, anybody who says Jesus lacks a sense of humor has not read these types of verses. Here's what, here's what he's getting at. He says, Pharisees, here's what you guys do, man. You walk around, you're proud, you're self-righteous, you're judgmental, you're looking inside people's spice cabinets and you're going, mm, you've got a little more oregano there than you should. But in your heart, you lack mercy and faithfulness and love. And so it's like this. Imagine you invite me over to dinner and you're going to make pasta and you go over to the sink and you begin to strain out that pasta and you're getting all the little particles out with your strainer. But there is a camel in the pasta. Right, you see that? I've got out all the bugs, got out all the dirt and we sit down and you go, but I'm supposed to eat this, this camel, right? That you did not get out of my food. Jesus says, here's what you've done. You have strained out all the tiny little infractions and you've listed them up so that you can stand on your hill and say, I am good. You are bad. God loves me. He doesn't love you. I am in and you are out. To create a sense of moral superiority, he says, you've strained out a gnat, but you forgot the big stuff like the love of God, like mercy and justice and faithfulness. He says, if you're going to judge, make sure your standard is correct. Now, I'm going to guess that nobody in this room has gone to somebody else's spice cabinet to try to assess their spirituality. But maybe you, maybe you have set up some kind of a standard, at least in your own heart, by which you judge somebody else, right? So where do your kids go to school? Are they, are they homeschooled? Do they go to public school? Do they go to private school? And how do you set up your sense of spirituality based on that? How old are your kids when you let them have a, a smartphone? Were they six or were they 27? 
right? And, and you set that up. And you say, based on that, I'm a, a good parent and you are a subpar parent, right? Or, or it may be around things like food and drink, right? You, you, clearly, the Bible draws a line around drunkenness, but it may be you say, you know what? I have decided never to drink alcohol and everybody outside the circle is morally inferior or vice versa. You may say, you know what? I drink alcohol, therefore I am more mature than everybody inside this tiny little legalistic circle. And I create a standard that I made up by which to judge somebody else. Let me give just a couple of others. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, 100%, or maybe you work and you look across and you create a standard of moral superiority. When I was in college, the, the, the debate among college students was, do I date or do I court, right? And depending upon how you define those terms, that could determine whether you were one of the really spiritual ones or one of the subpar ones. Do I follow Dave Ramsey or Crown or some other financial plan? Do I eat clean or do I sometimes go through the line and I eat three cookies? What Jesus says is this, when you make moral judgments, you, you'd best make sure that the standards that you're using are God's standards and not your standards. Because why? Matthew chapter seven, as we continue in verse two, he says, in the way you judge, you'll be judged. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. You wanna set up a standard, okay, You'll be judged by that standard. You want to set up a metric of spirituality. There are a hundred metrics by which you could be judged outside. And so make sure your standard is correct. And secondly, Jesus says, not only make sure your standard is correct, but attend to your own sin first. Verse three, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now again, another funny image that Jesus used. He says, Here, here's you Pharisees, you're walking around and you're like, hey, hey, there's something there in your eye. I need to get it out, that's my job. I need to pick every little thing out of your eye. Pick, 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 and Jesus goes, you have a log on your face. All right, that's what he's saying. You're walking around, you've got a giant log on your face, and you're like, I know there's something wrong with your eye. And he says, you hypocrite. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is somebody who pretends to be what they are not, who actively says, you know what, I am righteous and you are unrighteous. And Jesus says, that's what we do when we set up a standard that is not a biblical standard, and then we apply it to others. That's what we call legalism, right? I set up a law of my own, and then I say, you are in or out. God loves you or doesn't love you. I am morally superior or inferior based on this standard, and I use my standard to condemn. And Jesus says, the problem is you're walking around with a log in your eye. You have not looked first at the reality that you are a sinner, every bit as much in need of the grace of God as the person you're judging. That's the issue. It's the heart with which we judge, not the judging itself. See, where is the Sermon on the Mount ultimately gonna take us? If you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus do? Well, he moves us from external compliance to the law to the internal realities of our heart, right? So you've heard it said, don't murder. I'm gonna tell you right now, if you hate your brother in your heart, you have committed murder in your heart. How's that for a standard of righteousness? You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm gonna tell you, anybody who has looked at a woman with lust has committed adultery in his heart. Now, Jesus is not saying that literally you've committed adultery. He's not saying that the consequences of looking with lust are the same as committing adultery. What is he saying? That the sin of adultery starts in the heart. The sin of murder starts in the heart. And so Jesus says, before we begin to set external standards, you need to understand that, that all of us, fall short of the standard of God. 
And where Jesus will end the Sermon on the Mount is he's gonna say, look, you need to build your foundation not on the shifting sands of your own righteousness, but on the rock of Jesus Christ. So he's gonna say, you attend to your sin first. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but it does mean don't be a hypocrite. All right, so I was thinking about that this week. What what, what might that look like then to, to judge when I haven't attended to my own sin. So imagine for a moment that I, that I say, you know, those, those millennials, they are always on their phones. I know I've seen six articles about it on Facebook just today. Kids, don't play too many video games. It will rot your brain. Now let me scroll in peace, right? Well, what have I done? I've created a standard. I've applied that standard to others to make myself feel superior. But I don't meet my own standard. Right? If, if I invite you to lunch and you show up 15 minutes late, I don't like that. Right? But when I show up 15 minutes late, it's because I have a good reason. And you need to wait. So what is Jesus saying? When we judge... We judge carefully and we judge charitably. And again, where the Sermon on the Mount is going to take us is this, that in the judgment of God, all of us fall short and all of us deserve death and condemnation. And so so if we read the Sermon on the Mount rightly, we'll go, yeah, this is what life ought to look like. But I know it doesn't because I have fallen short of every standard Jesus has laid out on that list. And so what do I need? I need grace. And so Jesus sets himself up as the answer. so, So the answer is not that I can build some sort of mountain of moral superiority to earn God's approval. But instead, I stand under the judgment of God And I say, God, the only way that I can get out from under your judgment is through Jesus. And and we know the end of the story in Matthew, right? Jesus died in our place and Jesus rose from the dead so that all who trust in Jesus Christ can have eternal life. And the righteousness of God is granted to us in Jesus Christ. Right, so that now when we make judgments, right, the purpose of those judgments is not merely to condemn, to say you are out and I am in, I am good and you are bad. Instead, the purpose of those judgments is this, to say, look, I want you to understand that life and peace and blessing, as Jesus says, is found in, in God. That there's a reason that God sets standards in place for the world because God made the world and he knows that our lives work better when we are living in harmony with him. You want to know how to get into harmony with God? Jesus is going to say it's through him. And then you trust him and you follow the voice of the spirit of God. So that when we see a sinner walking away, as James says, we go to them and we say, man, that's, that's not the best way. You're walking off a cliff. And I'm telling you that not because I hate you, not because I'm better than you, but because I've experienced the life and the grace of God. And I want you to experience it too. Come over here, step away from the cliff and come to life. That's what Jesus is saying. When we make judgments, we do so carefully and charitably. So quickly, as we close, a few principles to apply. First one is this, if we are to err, err on the side of grace. One of the things I think Jesus is is saying is this also, we are not as aware of even our own motivations and hearts as we would like to think. And we're certainly not aware of the motivations of the hearts of others. So when I see somebody doing something that falls outside of my understanding of God's standards, it's not that I, that I never judge, that I never ask them to move or change. It's that I err on the side of grace. That's a way of saying I, I try to believe the best first. 
I err on the side of grace. And then if I must confront, pray before you confront. God, is my standard right? Is my heart right? Years ago, a much older, wiser man told me, look, about 90% of the stuff that people do that makes you upset, you're better off just letting it go. But that remaining 10%, when there's a pattern of disobedience, when there's a movement toward destruction, first you get on your knees and you say, God, is my standard right? Do I understand this right? Is my heart right? Pray before you confront. Thirdly, judge by the standards of God rather than a standard you made up. Fourthly, remember that you are a sinner. Remember that I am a sinner in need of the grace of God. And so I approach in any of these situations with humility, seeking restoration. And so we may approach and we may say, hey, it seems to me from reading the scripture and from what I know of your life, I see you transgressing a certain sexual boundary perhaps or a certain boundary in the workplace and you've moved toward dishonesty and greed and I see this. And what I want for you is life and harmony with God and others. And here's what I see in the scripture about those issues. So turn from that because I love you and because God loves you. Remember that you are a sinner and approach with humility, approach with grace, and then seek restoration rather than condemnation. That's the goal of making moral judgments as men and women who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ to say, I am a sinner set free by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know the life and the health and the peace that comes from pursuing him in the power of the spirit of God. So we seek restoration for the purpose of of reflecting Jesus Christ and knowing him deeply. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful for your word. Lord, we thank you for the conviction that it brings, the power that it holds. Lord, we ask that our standards would be your standards. We ask that our hearts of grace would reflect your heart of grace. We pray you'd give us your wisdom. Father, fill us with your spirit as we long to know you and seek to pursue you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.